It is Friday, March 22nd, 2024. This is another edition of Football Today. You know that dude, Bobby Skinner from the Talking Giants world. I am Chris Rose. Justin Pennick, he'll be back with us hopefully next week. Wish him well. So uh, instead of three wide, we're going with 12 personnel today. I like it. I'm a big fan of 12 personnel. It's starting, you know, it's been utilized pretty well in the NFL. That's why you always got to have two blocking tight ends on the roster for this type of stuff. I forget. Were you an O or a defensive lineman? What were you? Offensive lineman. I I played both in high school, but in college, it was offensive line. Did they ever think of moving you to tight end? No. So the first year I played football was my freshman year in JV. And, you know, you don't really, when you start watching football, you don't dream about blocking people. And, you know, I'm I'm six, you know, I'm six, seven now. I was probably like six, five at the time. And I go up to my coach and say, hey, you know, if we're in the red zone, if you ever like, you know, want to put me a tight end and and throw me a jump ball, like, I think that could be work. And he's like, how about you just fucking worry about blocking? And that Ah. was, that, that was the end of my receipt. We did run Wildcat my senior year. That was big. And I was like, technically the tight end. But, and levied like please give me some a touch but they never let me do it so did you have to check in do the whole detroit lions thing no because i, I don't think i ever came in as eligible i was just like the six i was you know Got the it. third person from the center so i don't think i was ever eligible but i did play defense i, I had a deal with my high school coach that if i ever got a touchdown i was allowed to get an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty but that never that <laughs> Never happens. I had some. I had I had three pretty solid celebrations planned out. That's a that's a good one. Well, maybe a, another date we you can give us all three, and then Panic and I will judge them. Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I'm I'm like itching to tell him right now, but I understand we got to wait for Justin. Yeah, we do, we do. All right, let's get this thing going. I believe on the previous episode or one of, one of them, we talked about Mike Williams being a free agent. And you you said. Correct me if if I'm reading the words wrong. It would be horrible if he ended up with the Jets. Well, Mike Williams has now signed a one-year deal that could be up to $15 million with the Jets. So now that you've had a little time to think about what you have said, Bobby Skinner, do you still hold true to that? Well, the the contract is one year up to $15 million. We haven't found the details of that contract yet, by the way, which is very weird for it to take that long for, you know, a one-year non-quarterback contract so obviously we could get back the details and it's you know it's 12 million dollars and and per game roster bonus you know active you know active roster bonuses and that changes things but i just don't view this as the right investment for for the jets right like he's 29 years old coming off of the torn acl you know he fractured his back in 2022 he's had other big injuries and small injuries in his career and they already have like the wide receiver one and Garrett Wilson. I just feel like that money would have been better in like investing in a couple depth guys, or maybe you bring back Carl Lawson, or you do what you need to keep Bryce Huff there instead of having you know going from that great defensive end rotation to now Will McDonald is your is your first guy off the bench. I know they invested in him, but you know he hasn't shown a ton in the NFL yet. I just felt like that this wasn't the right like splash move for the jets like you got I had to take risks like you know taking tyron smith with his injury history you had to do that you did you, you took care of the offensive line mm-hmm. but i just didn't view this as the the right move for the jets because i don't think he's gonna play i don't think he's gonna stay healthy right like history shows with mike williams he's not gonna stay healthy and he's older and coming off another his biggest injury really well a few things about mike williams you hear glowing reports out of the Chargers facility about him, like one of the most beloved players. So I do think that there's a little bit, you're you're paying for production and being on the field. I get that. But when you're getting a guy, particularly that's coming into New York, that you don't have to worry about anything else with, that's good. Like you can check that box and feel nice because New York has chewed up and spit out plenty of really, really good athletes in any sport. Then you start breaking down the Jets wide receiver room and it's very short exercise because it's Garrett Wilson and no one else. Last year, he had 1,042 yards receiving. Would you like to guess how many yards the rest of the wide receiver room combined had? Oh gosh, it had to be horrible. It's, it's, it's a testament to Garrett Wilson that he's been able to put up a thousand yards both seasons yes. uh, of his career. <laughs> 
But we know Alan Lazard was a failure. Miko Hardman was traded away. I mean, it was it was pretty damn bad. A lot because of quarterback play, but also because Aaron Rodgers forced the Jets to sign out Alan Lazard, who's still yeah. on the roster, by the way. And Randall Cobb, he forced him to sign. I like, I love Randall Cobb as a career. He's I mean, got- Cobb was a cheap contract, but Alan Lazard got the same amount of money as Jacoby oh, yeah. Myers. Like that was, know. you know, when Aaron Rodgers was like, oh, I didn't give them a list. Yes, yes, you did give him a list, and they made like Alan Lazard was. He was a. He's always been a product of Aaron Rodgers. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so I didn't give the answer. Six hundred fifty-four receiving yards amongst the rest of the people who played wide receiver last year. That's insane. That's insanity to have, you know, seventeen hundred yards in a seventeen-game season from your wide receivers. Uh, Garrett Wilson had four receiving touchdowns. The rest of the receivers combined for three. So they. My point is, they need production. I don't know if you've heard. Don't know if you've heard this. It's a very deep wide receiver draft. So they could. I mean, I suppose if one of those three monsters is available at 10, and now that they've gotten Tyra, you and I both think they still, it wouldn't be nuts for them to invest in the offensive line. But they do need to help Aaron Rodgers this year. So maybe taking one of those beasts will help. Yeah, there's, it's, it's, I think they're one of the more fascinating picks in the draft because mm-hmm. they are in such win now mode. Because they do have, like, it's not a great defensive draft at the top, and they've got a really good defense. But, like, o- like o- offensive line would probably be a smart move for them, but they have five starters. like, okay. And they have, like, five highly invested in starters. You know, getting Morgan Moses, John Simpson, and Tyron Smith in free agency gave all those guys good money. Elijah Vera Tucker is amazing. He just has been hurt. And then Joe Tipman, who they drafted in the second round last year. So they have five highly invested in starters but you know in, there's big injury risk uh, across that with probably their past two and uh, Elijah Vera Tucker and Tyron Smith so um I don't think it'd be the worst thing but it'd be it would be weird to draft a backup on the offensive line with the 10th pick but I, I kind of wanted them to go wide receiver but at the same time what you know rookie wide receivers don't always come along quickly with Aaron Rodgers so if all three of those guys if Harrison neighbors, and Odunze are gone, and I don't think they'll all be, but it's possible that the Bears at nine take one of those guys or the last of those three guys. I suppose it's possible, depending on how things shake out. I could see the Jets trading out of 10. Because I think that's what they should do, honestly. Uh, yeah. If someone's willing to do that, that's what I think their best bet is because, you know, there's a nice cluster of similar, you know, similar rated guys right there, and then they can just take best player available um, and it you know, can hopefully fit a need better. I should have done this, but didn't, isn't this the year that he gave up the Rogers two to green Bay? Yes, I believe so. And I don't know if they've got anybody else's two from a, a deal elsewhere. So yeah, you're right. I think obviously eight at, at with Atlanta and <laughs> I think six, eight and 10 are the three most interesting spots in the draft, but we'll talk about somebody else who's actually ahead of the New York giants where, the draft could just go get turned on its head. So we'll see. We'll yeah. See. So, but it's so again, that's why I think that now you have to have a, uh, you have to have a trade partner, right? We always just like, oh, just trade down. There's got to be someone that wants to trade down uh, with. So I, I don't know what they're going to do, but they could use a slot wide receiver. Um, yeah. That to me, they, they are, they are like the most fascinating pick that doesn't involve quarterback in this draft. I would agree. All right, uh, let's move on, but continue on with wide receiver talk. Before we even put on on the brown and orange, Jerry Judy got an extension with the Cleveland Browns, three years, 58 mil, 41 of which is guaranteed. They picked him up in a trade with Denver for uh, fifth and sixth rounder. Are you confused, or do you understand this move? Well, you know in Step Brothers, when the interview is going really well with Seth Rogen, And then the fart happens, and they're like, all right, now the tuxedos seem a little bit fucked up. Like, that's what the Jerry Judy trade is for the Browns for me. Where it's like fifth and sixth, I like Judy a lot more than the public does. That's awesome. And then he signs this contract with 41 mil. When I first saw it, like, okay, it won't be much guaranteed. Nope, $41 million guaranteed. Now the trade seems a little fucked up. I want to ask you, what do, how do you feel about it? Because I know you're not as high on Jerry Judy as me. It's your Browns, and they have a, you know, the Deshaun Watson contract has him in a very weird cap situation. So I didn't um, 
I didn't mind the trade, particularly this year. We've discussed that once you get to the kind of the back end of the fifth round this year, I think a lot of GMs are, are they want to get out. They don't like what's down there. I know it's fifth, sixth, and seventh rounders. People say, well, they're flyers anyway. M- most times people see some diamonds in the rough. This year, when you talk to talent evaluators, they're like, there's going to be a shitload of trades just getting out for future picks. Um, so I did like the move. When I, when I heard that they were possibly going to extend him to lower his cap number, I was like, man, oh, man, I don't know. He's been kind of a disappointment in Denver, and I know that's for several reasons. The coaching situation has been in flux. The quarterback situation has been very much in flux. I always felt like he was going to be a stud, dude. When he was taking 15th overall, I was like, that's the guy I'm buying stock in. And he just wasn't great. My only hope is this as a Browns fan is that he gets around his childhood hero, Amari Cooper, both from Florida, both went to Bama, models his game after Cooper, and being around a consummate professional like Amari Cooper will unlock whatever that talent is and make it worthwhile. Because if not, they could be staring at a contract a year from now where they're like, shit, why did we do that? And and Jerry Judy obviously hasn't lived up to the draft type, but I do think he's been a pretty good wide receiver in the NFL. Like he's like, watch him go run routes. The man, I mean, he almost had a thousand yards in a in a season ago. where he missed two games uh, a two years ago, and you know how many times did we see him wide ass open and Russell Wilson just didn't pull the trigger on him, and then the one year with Teddy Bridgewater, he got hurt in the first game of the season. So I, I like so like other wide receiver two guys that got signed this year were Darnell Mooney and Gabe Davis. They, those guys got thirteen mil. You know, I know the cap went up, but Jacoby Myers got eleven million dollars per year. Again, the cap has inflated, but why is Jerry Judy the first person to like break the bank on a wide receiver two contract? That doesn't and and it's, it'd be one thing if he got like 15, 16 mil, like more like I think he's better than Mooney and Gabe. He is better than Mooney and Gabe Davis, but I don't think he's you know six million dollars per year, you know, over two thirds of the contract guaranteed better than those guys. Yeah, I was surprised by it. Part of the reason I think is that he's still young. He doesn't turn 25 until the middle of the summer. Number two, they've got free agents galore after this year, right? Cooper, uh, Elijah Moore is a free agent. They've drafted Cedric Tillman in the third round. They're going to hope he makes a big leap. They drafted David Bell in the third round the year before that. He made progress last year, but he's not a guy who can separate. He's basically a catch it and squat guy. Like That's where he's going to land. So they just haven't done a great job in the draft of finding guys. And even in a wide receiver rich draft, maybe they don't trust themselves at that position. That's possible. Yeah. So again, I like the trade. I think it helps them pretty well. Like I, you know, I think that's a a pretty big upgrade. Like you mentioned, Cedric Tillman, you know, he can do some things, but he's not someone you're going to just throw out there and and be good. Uh, uh, David Bell, I'm not the biggest fan of. So I like the trade, but it's just, wow, I was surprised to see that yeah. much guaranteed money with a guy who missed games, never hit a 1,000 yards. You know, you've alluded to it, may, you know, be kind of a pain in the ass and, you know, uh, you know, off the field. Like, that's where I'm like, this, this is a big investment for someone who hasn't really proven to be worth that big investment. Well, let's remember what my cohort, my buddy Steve Smith Sr. had to say to him. Called him a jag. Just a guy and went on a huge diatribe where he said, you know, if somebody called me and said, should we trade for Jerry Judy? Like, no, he's an average wide receiver. I hope he, I hope Steve's wrong. I really do. I hope that Steve is wrong. I saw him feuding with Mark Schlereth too, which Mark Schlereth Twitter battles are some of the funniest. Um, And it always ends up with him bringing up that he won championships, which I love about Mark. Yes. But, but uh, according to Mark, the Denver Broncos have never done anything wrong. So, (laughs) you know, at some point, like that organization hasn't even made the playoffs since they won the Super Bowl eight years ago. It can't just be every player that leaves. There's got to be somebody else that needs to be held accountable in the organization. Well, and we, we, you know, we talked about this with the Brian Burns angle from the Carolina Panthers. It's like you, you, you scoffed at the trade offers a year or two, you know, the last two years. Mm -hmm. And then you do this. I mean, there was teams trying to trade for Jerry Judy, like second round picks or higher 
Yes. Not not no first round picks, but that was their thing. It was like, oh, we want a first round pick, and teams were like, no, we're not offering you more than a second round pick. And then you turn around and trade them for a fifth and a six. It's you. It looks bad to go. You know, look look back at that. All right, let's uh, let's do a little quarterback talk. Uh, we did not see him participate at the combine, but Caleb Williams, he certainly aired it out at his USC pro day this week. Uh, Williams, of course, the presumptive number one overall pick in Chicago, particularly after they just traded Justin Fields. I'm going to spin the clock draft-wise all the way back to 1998. That's when Peyton Manning went first overall. Since then, there will have been 19 quarterbacks selected first overall. Actually, that'll be 20 with Williams. 20. How high does Williams rank on your excitement meter out of those 20 that went first overall about them entering the league and changing the league. So I, I started watching football in 2002, so I'll, I will go from that point on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how excited I would have been about Michael Vick. I feel like me at that point in NFL, I would have been like, running quarterbacks don't work. Uh, so number one for me is Eli Manning, obvious reasons. I remember okay. looking at my you know TV that was this big and telling my dad who doesn't care about football, the Giants got Eli Manning. So that you know, that one is. A little bias included. And then it goes Andrew Luck, Trevor Lawrence, and then Caleb Williams. Mm. I, I truly love and, – and I think Caleb Williams can compete with, like, Trevor Lawrence for the type of prospect that uh, that he is. Like, I, I truly think this guy is special. Right? I don't think we're talking about how, like, how good he is just because he's been, like, you know, the projected first for two years, essentially. You know, won the Heisman uh, in 2022. You – you see highlights of him, right? And you see him running all all around, and you're like, Ugh, "Does that work, right? Are you just are you not able to just run a regular offense?" And then you go back and watch it, and you're just like, "Oh my gosh!" He almost every time he did all this backyard stuff was out of necessity. Like it was very rare where it's like, "Ah, he should have, like would pull the trigger and done this." Like Jaden Daniels, you watch him, and you're like, "Yeah, that was a nice seventy yard run," but you had Malik Neighbors open for a twenty yard dig, and he's literally throwing up his hands and and you're not throwing it that doesn't happen with Caleb Williams I think he has the best understanding of the quick game out of all the quarterbacks and then when you add the big arm and the crazy you know scramble drill plays he's he's a special player and I that's why I think the Chicago Bears are going to be a playoff team is because they've got some good talent and he's going to truly elevate that team all right so you said Eli for obvious reasons you said Andrew Luck which made sense. Once again, a guy who we had heard of for years, and then he was coming into an amazing situation, right? The Colts had been perennially a playoff team, if not a Super Bowl team with Peyton Manning, and then he has the fourth neck surgery. He can't play one year, and all of a sudden they're dog shit, and they get the first-round pick, and here it is as Andrew Luck. So we knew that everything else, the infrastructure was in place for him to continue to ascend that organization. Uh, you mentioned... Trevor Lawrence, two guy, one guy. I'm shocked you didn't mention. You, you weren't excited when Cam Newton came in the league. No, I I was I was very like old school football. Like we hadn't seen, you know, all like the you know we haven't seen like the guys who did a lot of the damage with their legs. So I was excited for him, but there was a lot of talk of Cam Newton being a bust around that draft. There he, was like I, I, thought... I watched at that point. I wasn't on Twitter and watching film i'm watching espn and they're like half the time they're talking about him there's one guy on the studio talking about him being a bus obviously he was amazing at auburn um like that was fun to watch but i, I wasn't as excited for cam newton as i was luck and and trevor trevor lawrence i was in in this media game luck was just like the ultimate one one guy well with cam though when he came in we had never seen the combination of athleticism and raw power with that right shoulder. The closest we had was Dante Culpepper, and he was such an unknown because he was coming from a significantly smaller school. UCF, baby. Yeah, when he came into the league. Um, whereas Cam had been at Florida and left, had gone to Auburn and won a national championship and a Heisman Trophy, and was a star of stars and had the big smile and the big personality, and there was a lot coming with him. And then frickin' his first game, he sets the rookie record for most yards. It was out in Arizona, I believe, where he threw for over 420 yards or something like that. And it just it took off from there, and it didn't disappoint. So I was excited about that. I will touch back on Michael Vick. 
Like Vic, I think it was his freshman year in the national championship game against Florida State. I want to say that's that's the year it was, where it was like incredible. Like he was must see, and it didn't feel like Virginia Tech was on a big game every week that that year, but he was so good. He was so good and just so elusive, any unlike anything we'd ever seen. And then Atlanta trades up with San Diego to go get that number one overall pick. And we're like, oh, shit, it is on. And there was no joke, man. When he came into the league, we were like, never had the quarterback been the fastest guy in the league. And we were like, this is it. This is when it's happening right now. This could turn the NFL on its head. And it did. And, and I told you I started watching football around like 01, 02. Um, and Michael Vick was the most popular player in the league. Like all everyone had, everyone at middle school had Michael Vick jerseys. It was he was the most, you know, he was on that Madden 04 cover. That was the first Madden I ever got. Um, like I still remember playing the first game with him on that. Uh, he was he was a cheat code in there. Now Cam, you mentioned Cam, Cam would be fifth after Caleb Williams for me. Uh, but also like the whole Mississippi State you know, pay to play thing. And then, you know, we all knew the Florida Gator stories of, you know, how he got kicked out. You know, that team, you know, that team was very close to my heart. Uh, so there was like a lot going around a lot around Cam Newton to where there was like question marks of, of how good he would be. Um, so, but he would be, he would be fifth on that list. You go back and look at it, man. And it's, you think there's more star power and it's, there's really not like Bryce Young, yeah, Joe Burrow. I li- I really did like Joe Burrow, but not as as much as those other guys. Kyler, I like, but you know, another short guy, Baker, bleh. Goff, bleh. I thought Jameis would be better, bleh. Yeah, I thought Jameis would be better too. Although I did see, I just saw an article. I was strongly in the Jameis over Mariota camp, which I was right about, but they still. Hey, let me tell you something. So, uh, covering the combine that year in 2015. Yeah, I sit up on the concourse set. So Rich and at the time Mayock were up in the booth. And then I think I was on the set with like Charles Davis and Daniel Jeremiah. And we had Jameis and Marcus Mariota on the set with us together. The, obviously the top two quarterbacks and presumably the top two picks in the draft as well. Mariota would not say a word. He was so quiet, so quiet. And Jameis is the exact opposite. He was a better promoter of Marcus Mariota than Marcus Mariota was. That's when I knew, like, Jameis was going to win any locker room he walked in, like, immediately. And Mariota was just a sweet kid, but he didn't want to say anything. He was shy. He didn't want to be on camera. And Jameis was like, let me tell you something. I've been competing against this guy forever, and he is a franchise. Like, he, I thought he was like a, a WWE hype man. I was like, holy shit, you got it. And I don't know. I think you can learn something about the quarterback position a little bit. That there. that year they played each other week one. And I was actually right. watching the game with one of my friends who's a Bucks fan. And Mariota throws for like five touchdowns, yes. zero interceptions. And I, I mean, I was I was getting ready to hide the bleach uh because I was I was worried for my friend in that moment. Cause that was because you imagine like you have all this debate one, two, and then they play week one, and then the number two guy Throws for five touchdowns and a zero interception. Now, Jameis, Jameis had a pretty good r- rookie year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like, I mean, did you see this Jameis in your, uh, video, by the way? Pound. What's up? Public service allow- announcement. Dog pound. What's up? Oh, uh, yes, I take. did. My one people take. did that. Yeah, one, t- one take Jameis. I love it. Oh, my um, gosh. So, yeah, I, 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 I love that we're doing like a – we're revisiting Jameis versus – Mariota, but yeah, I, so but Caleb Williams to me after luck, and I think really on the same, I I think like him and Lawrence, like I kind of view them and and similar, like I could go I could go either way on those two guys, but kind of getting circling back to Caleb Williams, I think you know Bears have this quarterback scar tissue that goes back decades and decades because of the futility of drafting quarterbacks and not having not only the lack of team success uh, because of quarterbacks, but also they just, they never shine. Like we still haven't had a 4,000 yard passer in the history of the bears. And we've been throwing the ball this rate for two decades now. Um, 
But who's been the QB that they've drafted where it's like, oh, how did that like Mitchell Trubisky? I like that was never gonna be great. I loved as a Gators guy, I love Rex Grossman. He was my favorite yeah. player in the NFL. Sad he won the Super Bowl, but that like Jay Cutler somewhat lived up to expectations with but the he Bears. also wasn't drafted by the Bears. He was drafted by Denver. When you're talking about guys who were drafted early, you know, McMahon was a top five pick. And you, you could say that Jim McMahon did live up to the hype. Now he and never Super Bowl. he never threw the ball in Chicago. He, I mean, I remember his days at BYU. He was one of the first quarterbacks at BYU to really air it out. He had an amazing holiday bowl one year. Um but he never had the chance to throw the football in Chicago. He was just the punky QB who was physical and tough and missed a shitload of games, but would run over dudes and was crazy and wore the Pete Rosell headbands and all that or sort of stuff. You never thought of him as a passer, although he did make the Pro Bowl one year, I believe. So there you go. Yeah, I was a big Jim McMahon fan in 1986. Will you stop? No, but I've, I've watched the, I've watched the Bears 30 for 30. Like he was, he was pretty. He just like you said, he missed games. You know, they had to go to Doug Flutie that year. Um. He just well, do you, he was nuts. I mean, I'm sure you saw in the 30 for 30 about the whole Pete Roselle wearing the headband thing. Where yeah, and then you know, you know, pulling down his pants in Super Bowl media. You know, it's crazy how open players and coaches were before social media. Like sometimes you forget. Like I go back and watch like some stray hand and tiki stuff, and it's like, man, these guys, these guys aired each other out sometimes. Like you know, Bill Belichick with uh, Bernie Kosar and the Browns being like, yeah, it's just. Physically not Dimin talented anymore. <laughs> the quote was diminishing skills. Yeah, like like they were they, skills. They were not afraid to like just speak what's on their mind. Now with social media, everyone's so guarded. Um, you know, but it's like they have these these guys used to just talk, and I kind of miss that. Uh quarterback needy teams drafting one, two, and three. That means Arizona's at four. GM Monty Austin Ford, he said that they will have a quote. Open for business sign on their front lawn. First of all, do you believe him? And second, is a trade back best for business? So it depends where they're trading. Like if the, if my Giants want to trade up there and they can drop back down to six and then they're guaranteed Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors, then I think it is best for their business. With the Vikings, they have a pick 11 and pick 23. I think the Vikings would have to throw in a couple more seconds, maybe another first to want to drop back that far because they just desperately need like a, a wide receiver for Kyler Murray. Like right now, wide receiver one is Michael Wilson, who I, I like him. But, you know, you drafted Paris Johnson, you signed Jonah Williams, so, you, you know, you're not going to go tackle. They need a ton of talent on defense, but they've already got yeah. a second first round pick, you know, an early uh, an early second. So, you know, you can try and plug and play there. I wouldn't drop anything below six unless the Vikings throw a godfather offer at them. Man. Okay, so this is a, a a deep draft in the first three rounds. And Arizona's got six of the top 100 picks as it sits right now. You got to remember, they also have Houston's pick, which I believe is 27. Yes. This is Will Anderson trade last year. They thought that that was going to be like four at worst. And it ends up being 27. Which I think trading with the Vikings, you're gonna they're gonna if the Vikings Vikings is a good chance they'll make the playoffs and that won't be a great pick either. Yeah, it's possible. They're certainly not gonna be dog shit if they go, trade up there. Um you are right about wide receiver. Their wide receivers last year. We talked about the Jets futility behind Garrett Wilson. Listen to this. Wide receivers made up just forty four percent of their catches last year. Forty four percent. They had fifty two percent of their receiving yards, both among the league's fewest. You talked about Michael Wilson. It's Michael Will out of their returning receivers on their roster this year, and they really didn't do anything in free agency to help themselves here. Michael Wilson had 38 catches. Greg Dorch had 24. The next wide receiver that is returning on their roster is Zach Pascal, who had four catches last year. They have nothing there. They have not only do they need to go wide receiver with their first pick, whether it's four or six or 11, they need to go wide receiver somewhere else as well. They just have nothing for Kyler Murray. They also have nothing in terms of pass rush. Virtually. Yeah, they, 
they they if you look at their defensive depth chart it's it's pretty depressing for the Cardinals. So they got to add so that that is the charm of trading back. It's like okay, let's just start plugging in some defensive needs, right? Let's take some swing on some defensive players. But the thing for me is just Marvin Harrison Jr. is it, I mean, I, I I think he's the best wide receiver prospect since Calvin Johnson. And I'm just not trading out of that unless I get a haul, a haul from the Minnesota Vikings, um, which they might do. Like, they're kind of positioning themselves to do. But you're going to really have to make it worth my while if I'm if I'm get, if I'm I'm moving off of Marvin Harrison Jr. or not having the backup plan of Malik Neighbors if they traded the six. Okay, but here's the other thing. We just think of it in a vacuum. We think of moving 4 to 11. How many teams have gone 4, 11, 8? Right, they'll trade back up. Like that's not the worst thing in the world to collect more assets, particularly when you have as many holes as the Arizona Cardinals do. I'm telling you that, like you look at the rosters in the NFL. Thank God they've got Kyler. So you, that's actually a great plant you threw out there. So like what the Miami Dolphins did a couple years ago. So mm-hmm. trade out of four and then trade back up to five. With the because I think the Chargers might be willing to trade back, but no one wants to. No one, no one that wants the QB wants to trade the five because then they could get jump for jump to four. Um, yeah, that if they could if they could finagle that, then yeah, if you can trade back and then trade back up to five, that's 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 fantastic. Well, but so let's play out the scenario. Five would want to trade, but so what does that net you? Maybe a second round pick because you would still have to move from eleven to five. You're going to have to give up basically everything that the Vikings would give you, right? Basically, maybe you can. Well, well, let's say the Vikings offer 11, 23, and two second round picks. And so now you have, so now you can offer, I think just 11 and 23 might get the job done for five because the Chargers aren't in the quarterback market. I mean, then, I mean, Monty Austin Ford gets gold stickers on his job chart, in my opinion, if you do that. I don't think the Giants are going anywhere. I think, you know, if, if they go anywhere, they're going up, not back, in my opinion. I don't think the Titans at seven, they need the best offensive lineman in the draft. They have to get the best offensive lineman in the draft. At eight, now Atlanta's primed to do anything because if the fourth quarterback is still on the board, which you and I both believe will not happen, right? You're in agreement on that? Yeah, I think someone's trading up for J.J. McCarthy. Right, but ahead of Atlanta at eight. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so in that case, Atlanta could get the best pass rusher Whatever it is, right? They could go Dallas Turner on the edge, wherever they want to go. And then you've got Chicago at nine. They already have their centerpiece. They get one of the be- three best receivers or whatever. So, I don't know. Jets at 10. We know that we just talked about their lack of wide receivers. Like, that's the team I think you would have to get ahead of. You might have to go up to Atlanta. I, I think you have to get ahead of the Giants because mm. I think the I- Giants – because of their quarterback situation, would talk themselves into J.J. McCarthy, even though I hope they don't. All right. Well, I think we laid out a really fun scenario where Arizona trades out of four and then trades back up. I would love to see how much it nets them. If they go, if they end up only going back one position in the draft and they, um, and they pick up two second rounders and they get the wide receiver that they wanted, I mean, that would be, holy shit, that would be great. That's amazing. I kind of i, I want to so I want to see what the what did the Dolphins so they traded the Dolphins first sent their number three pick in the twenty twenty one draft right. to the forty nine ers for the number twelve pick, and then they went up to six, I believe, to go Son get Devontae. Bitch, these damn su- subscribe shit. Why is Gainesville dot com? Do I have to right, NFL dot com? This is how we do it. You guys don't have ads. Thank you very much, Chris Rose. Yeah, well, see, I'd be a lot richer if we did. We throw an ad on uh, Bobby Skinner's. Uh, well, you have ads, but you don't have subscriptions. Uh, excuse, excuse me. Sure, we do. I can get you a good deal at NFL Plus. The twenty twenty one the to the forty nine ers. The Dolphins leap back into the top ten of the draft with another. Miami got the number six pick and the and a fifth round pick from the Eagles for the number twelve pick, a fourth round pick, and then a second round pick. So that's less than what we had proposed. So. Well, that's moving from 12 to 6 as opposed to 11 to 5. Four. No, 
Yeah, eleven to five. Yeah. So I mean, it's the same. It's the same jump. Yeah, it is the same jump. Okay. We're in business. Get it done, Arizona. I'm rooting for you. You know, I've got good good friend that works in Arizona. I can get this paperwork to the Cardinals facility if I need to. Tell the tell the tell the presses that we've got an idea. And then we just need to uh, guarantee Monty Austin Fort on the show as a guest to explain that we were the inspiration behind this. That's actually a great idea. You can you can make that happen, right? Oh God, yeah, that that can happen tomorrow. Okay. Well, not tomorrow. We're not working. But yeah, you understand what I'm saying. All right, NFL owners uh, looking into a bunch of new rules, right? The competition committee said, here, take these 10. Let us know what you think of them. The most interesting of which is the new proposed kickoff rule, similar to the one that the XFL used last year. So here, work with me, people. Uh, hopefully I'll describe this the right way. Kicker's still going to kick off 35-yard line, no problem. But the rest of the coverage unit is on the other side of the field, starting at the other team's 40. And then they're lined up against, like, the front line of the return team. Nine dudes right in front of them, like, 10 yards away. There are at least, there could be two gu return guys back in what is called the return zone, which is between the goal line and the 20. And so the ball has to end up in between the goal line and the 20. If it's a touchback, then the other team starts at the 35-yard line. So there is a severe disadvantage if you kick the ball in the end zone. The whole idea is to have as many returns as possible, but also to have as few high-speed collisions as possible. Hopefully I explain that so people can kind of get it in their head what it looks like. Do you like the rule? No, I hate it. And I hate the hip truck rule. And I don't care if I'm an old man in this. I hate, 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 hate. We don't have to change everything. Football is a game of injuries. There's oh, one type of tackle is always going to be the, I know I'm changing this into a hip, ta hip drop tackle conversation. Injuries are a part of the game. Obviously, you can make some tweaks and changes. But I just don't understand the need to try and change everything all the time. Like, I, I, I hate it. What about you? Well, okay, we can while you're here on the hip drop tackle. Um, when that became big news in December, it is when I was calling the Bengals Vikings game on NFL Network. So we spoke with both defensive coordinators, Lou Anarumo of Cincinnati, Brian Flores of Minnesota, and we brought it up to them at the end of the meetings, and they were like, Guys, what am I supposed to teach our people? Like the physics of football when a guy who's two hundred and twenty pounds is trying to tackle a guy who's two hundred and fifty five pounds. You can't use anything but your weight. Like, that's how you tackle them. So what are we supposed to do? I think that... How do you tackle someone from behind? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't understand what... Like, I understand where they're supposed to aim now. Head, knees. Like, let's get in the in the middle. Like, I understand all that. I think it's extremely difficult, but at least I understand that. When you, if you are to take out the hip drop tackle, I have no idea what you're supposed to do when you're a smaller person against a bigger person. So I don't get it. I'm with you on that one. This one, I think, could be really interesting because I do understand what they're trying to do. I do with like eliminating as many head injuries and high speed collisions as possible. Like I know that you said injuries are a part of the game; they are, but. Am I willing to see this stuff for a year? I suppose I am. I. It's going to be, you know, kickers are going to have to work on their touch. It's like grabbing a sandwich and just working on that at the range all day. I just. Football is a game with established rules, and you can change, the, you know, move from the 35 to the. Th but anytime you're changing something that is a part of the game at the college level, at the high school level, at the, you know, the PAL level. I just don't, I just don't like that. Like that's just now that's the kickoff game is just totally different than what it is at every other level of football in in the country. Like I, I just can't get behind that, right? And I like is have they put out evidence of all these big injuries on kickoffs and kick returns? They have, yeah, they have, they have. Um, they've studied this stuff. You know, I mean they they've made incremental adjustments remember you you used to be able to do the wedge right the line of the kickoff team where they would actually grab hands 
when the return guy is like 10 or 15 yards behind him and they would start running toward the coverage unit in a wedge formation, like you're not getting through us. And it was a very gladiator-ish mentality. And guys would just get blown up running into the wedge. They got rid of that stuff. They were like, yeah, I, I, I'm fine with that. But well, this is the next step in it. Well, how so, many next steps are there? At, at, you know, are they going to take the rule where they just. I'll tell you why there are next steps. There are next steps to the point where there aren't going to be any more law lawsuits. That's what we're doing here. All right. Good luck. So there you go. Speaking of injuries, last episode, we told you about Chase Young. We asked the question whether or not he could get back to his standing as defensive rookie of the year. Well, then it came out that he had neck surgery. Still signed a one-year $13 million deal with the Saints, and the Saints were okay with it. Like, they weren't like, oh, my God, he needs neck surgery. They were like, oh, yeah, he's having neck surgery, and he's probably not going to be ready for camp and may not even be ready for the beginning of the season. Does this sound insane? Well, the injury happened in last year's preseason. I called uh, that game. Yeah, it was versus the Browns. Uh, I don't think it's crazy because there's $8 million in per game roster bonuses. So, uh, you know, almost, you know, essentially close to half a million dollars per game. So if he doesn't play, it's a $5 million contract, which is very cheap for a pass rusher of his ability, let alone his potential or what he could get to. Like he was pretty, he was really, he was pretty good on the commanders last year, even though, again, we talked about how there's a little bit of undisciplined yeah, hunting play uh with the 49ers that didn't translate obviously so i it's a risk but i actually think it's a pretty small risk when you think about the fact that it's just a five million dollar contract if he doesn't pull it if you know if he doesn't play this year and i think they're expecting him to play yeah they don't have much they had they were i think they were bottom five in sacks i think they had 34 sacks as a team last year carl granderson led the way he had eight and a half but cam jordan was he played injured the entire year. He had two sacks. They need him to get healthy and get back. Uh, Brzee, the kid they drafted out of Clemson, looks like they could help him a little bit on the pass rush. He got better and better is what I was told. Um, so they need somebody that can give them something. Man, when you have a neck surgery, that scares the hell out of me. Yeah. That, and I know that they – it feels like – by the way, doesn't it feel like the Saints are always in cap hell? And that that's the thing that makes me a little bit on your side is that why are the Saints the teams that do it? Like if another team did the, hey, we're taking a $5 million risk that this guy can play and be good for it. But it's like, why, what are the Saints trying to accomplish with this? I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. Like they had the quietest offseason, it felt like, of almost any team outside of Dallas. And this is what they do. I know you say it's just five million dollars and it's a one year deal, so I, that's that's all fine. But I need. Well, this felt like an like, Eagles type. Like this is a deal that like I thought the Eagles right. would make, or you yeah. know, fill in the blank. You know, Super Bowl playoff contender, not the New Orleans Saints. Right, because they need Chase Young to be productive. Yeah. If the if the Eagles sign him and he gives them anything, you're like, oh shit, this is gravy. This is like a mid season trade for us. We did great here. Whereas yeah. the Saints need somebody to help them. I, I just feel like that organization is – they're stuck on the bottom half of mediocrity, and that is a horrible place to play. They, they don't have any – they don't know what they're doing in the future in the quarterback. They don't know if they've got the right head coach. They have so few splash players. Like, they just – they're blah. Like Yeah, that Derek Carr contract was always a bad decision. I, I don't – yeah, it, and it seems like that's – they've – like, I love Chris Olave as my wide receiver one. You traded a future first to trade up for Chris Olave. Like, that's to me. And they've done that, like, consistently. I think they did that for, um, what's the defensive end who's with the Viking Marcus Davenport. Like, they, yeah. they did that when everyone's like, oh, they're trading up for Lamar. And nope, they're trading up for the uh, a defensive end uh, who ended up being an okay player, nothing, nothing special. So, right. they just kind of love that mediocre, you know, that middle of middle of the road team that will win a couple of good games, lose some games that they're supposed to, and end up, you know, seven and ten, eight and nine, nine and eight. And they're far and away the least interesting team in that division. Even Carolina, as bad as they were, at least they're more interesting because you want to see if they can just get out of this it's enormous hole they've dug themselves into. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's just really no ceiling for that. like there's no the ceiling for that team is so low. Yeah. 
All right, so we're about a month away from the draft in Detroit. It's going to be great. I know Bobby Skinner has been pouring through all of his tape. And make sure you check out all of his stuff because it is really, really good. I love listening to your breakdowns. Good stuff. Um, and you're going to give us a a prospect of the week to kind of follow and maybe do a little homework on. And if, you, if you've already done it, you know, his breakdown, great. If you haven't, that's fine too. So every show in between now and then, give us somebody that you're high on. All right, so I've got a video coming out on this guy on Tuesday, and it's Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon. We actually got to sit down and talk with him at the Senior Bowl. Yes. Um, with all like the tackle talent, there's going to be a team that need like center is a big position of need for a lot of teams, and he just seems like a guy who's going to step right in and play, like you know, play at, at a near Pro Bowl level right away. You know, he gave up zero sacks, zero quarterback hits, and one pressure this past year versus Oregon. And, you know, they face a lot of stunts and stuff, and he just always just processed and picked up everything and then did really well. And I still think there's, like, room for him to grow in his game. So I have a video coming out on Tuesday, but I don't know where he's going to go. Interior guys are always hard to figure out where they're going to go because, like, hey, this guy's a first-round talent, but what team wants to draft a center with their first pick? Like, the, it's just a team that – this position that teams kind of – look at and say, ah, we, you know, this is something we could fill in the second or third round, or we'll mm -hmm. supplement this in free agency. So it's a, it's, it's going to be interesting where he goes. I, I would like to see him end up in, in Cincinnati. Mm. Wow. Well, that would be really interesting. He could play guard too, if needed. Or Buffalo, actually Buffalo would be a great fit for him. I uh, Maybe, well, maybe Buffalo is where I want to see him go. They just obviously cut ties with Mitch Morse after mm -hmm. many, many years. Uh, you know, with Cincinnati, isn't Teddy Karras their center? Yeah, maybe, but he, I think he can play guard too. Um, you know, but so I guess Buffalo would probably be the best fit for him. Interesting. So, a few things about him he is an enormous center. I think he's almost 335 pounds, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, it's at 6'3, I think he's like 325, and that was combine weight. So, I'm sure he probably sh shed a little bit for that. So, I mean, that is a massive, massive center. I think, you know, there's some teams that love to have their center a, a bit lighter, right? Jason Kelsey's been playing at 290 pounds forever, and he's been one of the most mobile centers. And how, how often do we see him snap the ball, and all of a sudden he's out kicking out? You know, like that's usually a guard move. But the fact that the center can do that, that's some elite shit. Can he move like that? Yeah, I mean, he can't move like Kelsey. Kelsey's a one-of-one -one guy right. at that position. Um, unless, you you know, Cam Jurgens, the guy who they're having replace him, was like a, a former right. tight end move center. Um, so he can't move like that, but like in pass protection, like he, sometimes he loses initially, but he's just able to get lateral and, and get in front of guys and recover. Um, and that really showed up at the Senior Bowl, too. That was like the thing that popped off for him down there. It's like, yeah, he had some quick, quick you know, like the, he lost initially, but was able just to recover. So... Strong hands can move well laterally and then just doesn't make any mental mistakes. That's what you want in your center. And I like bigger centers too. Um, there's two other guys that have played outside that are kicking inside, presumably. Uh, Fatanu, the guy from Washington, mm -hmm. right? It sounds like he's going to be a guard. And Barton from Duke, correct? Yeah, I did a video on Barton. I, I really like him. He's just like always technically sound. There's people that say he's going to move to center, which I'd like to see him play guard. Mm -hmm. um, Fatonu, I think, could actually play a little bit of tackle. Yeah, uh, but but he you saw but, him at the Senior Bowl, right? No, he didn't. But I I put him in like a midseason video okay. last year, so I I've got a good grasp of him. I'm thinking about doing a video on him too. So um, yeah, there's a lot of guys you know that could be moving inside uh, through through this draft. All right, I love it. This is the fun stuff where we all get to dig and we'll see everybody's top five list. Like Bucky Brooks from NFL Network does it, and there's guys from ESPN who do it. And they'll put out top five lists and the mock drafts and all this sort of stuff. It's, I mean, I think it's it's a ton of fun. Now we're going to hit the, the one month mark, and it's going to be a sprint to this thing. Yeah. So I have I have like 45 full evaluations done. My goal is to have 120. I wish I could have had more time to do this year round, so I could have like a two hundred fifty man board. So I, I have I have a I have a forty five man big board right now, but that obviously ramps up in the next month. Okay, great. I love picking your brain on this stuff. 
Uh, we are back again early next week. I believe we're going Monday. It's possible Tuesday. We will certainly let you know. And then uh, hopefully Justin will return so that we can run three wides because this group is shifty as hell. Who plays the slot? Who plays the slot in this group? Justin, definitely. Really? Like you're you're the guy who's been around for a while, good route runner, can still one on the outside. Penix, Penix a slot, and I'm, I'm the big outside receiver who you right. throw the jump ball despite what my JV football coach said. Yeah, that was kind of bullshit. We're gonna have to talk to that person at yeah. some point. I can I can box some stuff. I can box out on the sideline. All right. I want to thank all the good people that are helping put this show together. Maddie Mass filling in for Mikey today. Shout out, uh, Justin Pennick. Hopefully, we will see you again next week. Continue to uh, stream all of uh, Bobby Skinner's work as he is working hard to introduce you to the rookie class of 2024. I am Chris Rose. We will see you next time here on Football Today.